town in Murray Hill just rang. So it's 12 noon and it means it is Siegel time for our talks on Monday. And um, this is a very special talk for us, an important talk. Uh, it is the last one um, of our book talk series of 10, 10 uh, talk, but also the last of the year of this season. And in a way, um, you know, we experienced uh, so much uh, in our lives, uh, in our planet and in, in the world of theater and things we didn't experience, we thought we would. So um, we are um, having with us today a guest whose work, I think uh, we all know uh, so very, very much is Aiko or Aiko Otaka. Aiko, welcome with us. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to talk about her book. And um, the book, I think, is a very, very uh, important one. It's called A Buddy in Fukushima. Together with photographer William Johnston, she went over the over a decade, you know, for 10 years, because it's now 10 years since Fukushima happened, um, she went back and we're going to talk about uh, her work, her project, actually her first uh, solo project. Normally, she does collaborate with her partner, uh, Takashi Kuma Otake, and they are well known for working, collaborating together, actually world famous uh, in their work. And... Um, and it's a great honor and a privilege to um, to have them with us. So, um, Aiko, before we go into the specifics, uh, where are you and um, <laughs> what time is it? I'm in Japan. I am near Tokyo and it's 2 a.m. 2 a.m. That's a mid after midnight, two hours yes, after it midnight. Is, it is. And I can't quite blame Frank for this. He didn't aim. It's just my own reason that I'm here in Japan. So. Yeah, incredible. I'm, so we, I'm very happy to be here with you. Yeah, and this is your family home, I understand? Yes, uh, it's, you know, of course, it was my parents' home. And my father died 22 years ago. My mom died two years ago. I'm so sorry it's, to hear it's, that. it's literally, it's now my house. It's a mm -hmm. little house. But I still consider it as my mom's house. <laughs> Did you grow up in the house? No, I didn't. That's another didn't. reason. Yeah, they uh -huh. moved after, you know, I, I left them uh, when I was a young person. So I don't really feel that childhood memories here, except I always have so many memories of visiting her here. And in some years, I have taken care of her as, as she grew old. So there's lots of memories of her on everything mm -hmm. we have in here. Mm -hmm. And it's close to the Kamakura. Uh, uh, and not uh, far. This is not too far uh, outside right. Tokyo, which is such a beautiful, ancient, and also very spiritual town with many artists over centuries. It's true. Printmakers and writers, yes, um, yes. theater artists who live there. Um, Aiko, tell me about the book, Fukushima. Well, <laughs> the, when it was sent to me the first time, I didn't quite prepare myself for how heavy the book is. And in literal weight is like really heavy mm -hmm. because it was during the pandemic we mm -hmm. worked on it. Meaning, you know, myself and my photographer, collaborator uh, and designers were always talking over Zoom with a design, PDF exchange, making a comments. So everything was prepared, you know, over the internet and by phone and by writing, sending the, the, the you know, the, my text and uh, the ideas and the comments. But then when book arrived, not only it was bigger than I ever thought, even though I always knew the size and so much heavier. And it was, this is, we made a decision of using a printer in Belgium which is specialized for a very uh, like, uh, environmental friendly. So it is uh, a recycled, oh, it is the, the whole book is a recycled paper and the biogradable ink. So the whole thing feels like a weight, you know? It's a mm -hmm. literal weight as much as 10 years since yeah. Fukushima had a, a, a nuclear disaster. So to me, oh, like looking, not only my 10 years, but Fukushima's 10 years as a big object, which is very heavy. It's metaphorically heavy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this right. is kind of a surprise that I it's... 
fed. That's true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. As um, I think people who drink whiskey like to have the heavy whiskey glass because it also <laughs> represents the weight of the drink, you know? Yeah, uh, it's it's a kind of yeah. thing. You know, it's very, very different from what I was get so used to in a PDF form. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm glad we have that talk. It's been uh, also tragic that... Uh, so it has not been possible to have book celebrations, book talks, and bookstores. Normally, uh, our authors can go around. Um, that's why we created the Siegel Book Talks. We had Bonnie Maranka here with us, and Teresa Smalek, uh, Alexis Green was Emily Mann, Kari Perlov, and Catania, and Boga joined us, and then Avra, Isidro Lupulu, and Frank Rabatz. And, and now you, uh, as a point at the end, we just talked uh, last week, you know, about that uh, new age we are entering but it was frank and abra write about the anthropocene that is mm -hmm. the all of a sudden the history of the planet is interfering now in a very serious way with the history of mankind and our history perhaps how it hasn't done before that uh, a coronavirus doesn't respect borders you know it doesn't care as does radiation um tell me how did the idea for your project, a, a body in places, a, a body in Fukushima, how how did that come to you? Um, so my a body in Fukushima has always been the part, a part of, but also the beginning of my a body in places, which is an overall title of my solo activities. Okay, when I perform solo anywhere is mm -hmm. a body in places. So that be the Wall Street, that be the Fulton Center, that be in Florida, that be in Hong Kong. I always call it places because people can know, oh, she's here with me here on this street, on this plaza. But she has been, my audience are informed, she has been in different places. At the beginning, was my body in Fukushima. So the first time I went without a performing, without any notion of my solo activity, but just going to Fukushima after the disaster happened was 2011, hmm. that August. So five months after. Five months but that after. happened to me in the middle of egg and commas retrospective which was a three-year project, which actually consumed us for five years, you know, from the time mm -hmm. we pre begin to prepare, and then we finished. Five years of preparing a retrospective that is supposed to be middle of our career. And so it was never supposed to be like end of our career, but five years is a long time to look back or 40 some years of work. <laughs> So I was kind of maxing out the examining egg and commas work. So by the time uh, retrospective was in a full swing, I was itching to do something beyond the egg and coma. And then when Fukushima happened, I was already teaching nuclear matters. I had a very late MA on atomic bomb literature. So this is something to study about atomic bomb and what kind of artist did with an experience of that hard to describe beyond so-called imagination, but it actually happened experience. How the artist can work out of those experience was something I've been always thinking about and teaching about. And the atomic bomb is a nuclear matter and nuclear plants are also nuclear matters. And both are human creations. And both has a massive environmental disasters as possible to happen. Atomic bombs might have been aimed to kill enemy people, but it also destroys the environment. Nuclear plants, it might have been aimed to create electricity, but so much possibility as such a complicated machine happened to break down, make an accident, make um, 
nuclear disaster. And that's not only inconvenience to the human being, but it is an environmental disaster. So in me, all the nuclear matters are very connected. So mm -hmm. when that had happened, without ever thinking doing my sorrow, I had to go to Fukushima because I felt as a person who teaches atomic bomb and radiations, I had to know. And at the time it was very confusing because not much information is readily available. You know, when something so big happens, the books don't come in too quickly. You have internet, you know, internet knowledge, but it takes a long time for people to grapple and come up with certain ways of creating a knowledge that is not just information. So one of the way as a body-based person, I often feel I learn by being in a place. You know, your whole body experience it, and it's not a information that you just get it online. So I went to there with my friend. But then by 2014, when our retrospective project of egg and coma ended, I was ready to go back. And that time, I wanted to do it as a part of my solo project. So mm -hmm. my solo project started with not an happy melody way, because going back to Fukushima with a camera, you know, with a, with a collaborator, a photographer, and a historian was a heavy decision. And I did not know at the time we would still go back another five times. So we did. So altogether, I was there six times because I was there alone first. And there was a photographer five times. Yeah. And, and all of the result, you know, selected result, I have shown it in different ways, in a different places where I go to perform my sorrows. So I was hoping audience will both know, will know, oh, Eiko performing on Wall Street. Oh, Eiko was in Fukushima. Oh, she's wearing the same costume. Oh, she's not a young person. Oh, she had gone back to Fukushima. Oh, the church down the street has an exhibition. So I was trying to connect my performance activities in the US or elsewhere to the things that I did, the same body I was in Fukushima. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an extraordinary uh, project. You are bearing witness, I think. Um, I think you talk about, uh, you don't want to forget about it and you don't want others to forget what happened. For mm -hmm. centuries um, from now, you quote your, your friend, Kyoko Hayashi, who you also mm -hmm. dedicated the book, she said, uh, people who died in the atomic bombings, they were denied a personal death and their bodies also disappeared. If you look at Fukushima, also you don't see bodies, radiation, you can't smell it, you cannot see it, but you brought your body um, 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 to Fukushima. And yes. um, as, a, as, a, as a dancer, you threw your body in life as Pasolini said, what artists should actually do, they should take their body and throw it in life and participate. For all our listeners, um, let me tell you a little bit about the important work um, um, of Aiko. Aiko was born and raised in Japan and she's a movement-based interdisciplinary artists, so it's movement, uh, photography, uh, uh, writing, uh, film, video. And she uh, is based in New York since 1976. She studied with legends in theater, the people who changed what we think about theater. She studied with uh, Tatsumi Hichikata and uh, Kazuo Ono in Japan, the founders really of the Buto movement and from the north, from the Tohoku region, who said we have to show the, 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 the burnt skin, the scars, and they rejected traditional Japanese history after World War II, but they also had a horror of the new American culture that come and created something completely new because they felt there was nothing else. They really 
um, M. Koto, she studied with them and then went to Germany and with Manja Kimmel in Germany, she studied the Bauhaus dancing. And then together with her partner, Takashi Kuma Otake, she came uh, to New York and she created that now also so well-known uh, um, uh, dance uh, movement duo, duo Aiko and uh, Koma. They created almost 50 interdisciplinary works all around uh, the US, the Whitney Walker Art Center, MoMA, they are very well-known internationally. They got um, significant uh, uh, prizes, the Doris Duke Award, uh, the MacArthur Fellowship, uh, the United States Artist Fellowship, and many, many more. You can look her up and um, we have her with us here. So um, uh, you get an idea of it. So what she is sharing with us today as an artist, but also as a human, is, um, is, is extraordinary. You and the house of your mother, you said she died two years ago. Uh, uh, very movingly, I think also in the book, you talk about how you and your mother were taking old red fabric, silk yes, from kimonos. Yes. You brought old kimonos. Yes. You saw them together. Um, tell us a little bit. Um, why would you bring old kimonos? Why your mother's kimono and your grandmother's kimono? Right. So as I said, I was there alone before I went back with a photographer. So in 2011, I already saw what was immediately happening, okay? So in my mind, I needed not to talk as someone who experienced. I'm not from Fukushima. That is not my hometown, even though I spent four years in, in the Providence, no, not Providence, prefecture. Prefecture. Next to it, yeah, prefect next to it. So the, the landscape was very familiar before the, the nuclear disaster. And of course, people had to fret. So, you know, the, the, the scene that I was seeing is the aftermath. And I felt bringing color because, you know, that especially the place where tsunami had affected you know, the things are very chaotic and dusty, right? Because tsunami brought all that, you know, the water and dirty, and the dirt was mixed up. So everything in the house is covered by the sort of like a thing or a thick layers of dirt and, and it comes up as a very dry and the, the colors are very infused with that dust. So bringing my mom's, and I, in fact, I ended up, all the fabric are from my grandma's. My mom helped me to create, you know, by sewing the pieces together. But all the costume I wore in Fukushima until the last trip are from kimonos from my grandma. And by bringing all the people's kimono that we no longer wear in our daily life, is to me to identify myself or at least emerging the ancestors. You know, because there are, there are, there are people who, who had to flee, but they can talk their tales. Journalists are interviewing them. They are writing, some of them are, you know, writing poems, paintings. I met those people. So it's not my job to, to bring their voices because they do have their voices, you know, their lawsuits. So there are very much moving stories witnessing from their own perspective. So what I probably instinctively felt is to think about the mountains, to think about water, to think about people who died and their, their bones are in their family graves. So somehow bringing all the material, the color, very vivid kimono colors into this dusty place is my addition. It's like, it's like my palette to bring. So this is why it's not only my body, but my being a Japanese person who grew up in Japan before I moved to the US. It's not just me being there but me, myself, bringing a palette of colors and the materials that belongs to my, beyond my own memory. And I think it was important for me to carry that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it is. It is so remarkable. If um, we look at the book, and I'm just going to show it, I would say um, mo most of them are actually photos um, and some essays, poems of you, also from William, some reflections. Maybe you have. I think you have a small um, 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 video clip where you compiled. Um, some of it, so our our audiences um, um, can see it again. Fukushima is uh, the second largest nuclear disaster, I think, in the history of planet Earth. Um, people say, a scientist, for the next 800 to 1,000 years, um, this landscape will be untouchable. You cannot go back in. It will be contaminated. It's a failure of mankind and the idea of the technos, the idea of uh, the Apollonian thinking, as we talked with Franz Schwadat, where we think we could master earth and um and it has shown us um that uh it is not um, um not as easy as we all thought and we have to completely rethink um our engagement with nature and um and the idea from uh, uh, bruno latour which we also talked about last week where we have to understand that humans are no longer the solo act of the denser on planet earth that everything is connected to everything and we are just one part of it and we have to respect it so if you're ready let's have have a look it's got two three minute clip and maybe tell us a little bit about it. yes so these are just a short but very short video but mm -hmm. i actually created from the very first time i went with a bear who is my photograph uh, historian collaborator i've always created videos because after all, I'm a choreographer and a performer. Yeah. I'm a time-based artist. Yeah. And the photography is an interesting way to show the time. Because mm -hmm. video's time, if I video myself moving in Fukushima, video's time is real. But in a photography, you can imagine what happened before or what could happen next. I can also change the orders of the video, of the photos, to create a sense of choreography. Mm -hmm. But I'm not showing my movies I have made. In fact, I think my film will be shown in a film festivals. Mm -hmm. But so it's usually it's two hours, and I made it as long as seven and a half hours. But this one I'm showing is only three minutes, and I'll start, and I'll explain to you as we go along. So this is a very fast survey, just to, to give audience, mm -hmm. like you know, how, so this is January, 2014. So this is the first time I went back with a photographer. This is one of the Tomioka station of Joban line. And you can see how even this is three years, nearly three years after the disaster, things are quite closed up. And I can kind of see myself as almost like an only body in the landscape where human, humans used to be. And we went back the same summer and just to see the grasses grow and still the same chaos remains, dusty. At the same time, the colors are more vivid just because of the greens, you know, compared to the winter, which was very, very, um, very raw and not colorful. But then we also see the piles of radiated materials, you know, next to the amazing greens because they are thriving. They are radiated, but they're still thriving because of no human beings around. And in fact, some of the wild animals were also really made lots more. That doesn't mean they're healthy, they're still radiated. Mm -hmm. the, by the time we went back in 2016, the government really started to do this a big job of cleaning up, so-called cleaning up. And of course, they can really never clean, clean, but they are doing it in a way. Mm -hmm. of, you know, it's a temple, right? Yeah, we just yes, saw. yes. And sometimes we have to go to the temple to find a quiet place because so much of the machinery were brought in, both cleaning up and decontaminating. But when we actually see the stations preparing for the, you know, running the trains again, we start to see, and we start to realize, oh, we not only came by the 2016, not to just report and witness the disaster, but how the disaster made 
government and local office, office people to change the area, you know, how to recover the area. So now, now there are so many places that we couldn't go in. Now they are allowed to not only go in, but the government says, oh, it's now safe to live in. But people haven't really came back by too many numbers. And it's understandable because if you have a small children, you know, they, they are not coming back. So some of the older people comes back, but the proportion of the people who came back is very small. But you can see how the mound of the concrete everywhere in the seashore. But those mounds of the concrete does not necessarily, does not necessarily save the area nor the people if the same, same high tsunami ever come. I mean, tsunami was 69 feet high. Hmm. So even though those humongous you know, sea walls, I understand the reason of wanting such, you know, but at the same time, we have to realize it really changed the environment and was good. Yeah. And the nuclear cleaning up is extremely hard because you may be able to clean up the, the field, but you can't clean up the mountains. So the next storm comes or next tsunami comes, it is very difficult. Plus entirely cleaning up the water, you know, dirty water, dirty meaning uh, radiated water is nearly impossible. So they clean up what they can, they're processing it. But then I think in the next few years, they're going to release into the back to the ocean. And those mm -hmm. are contaminated waters. So I'm very, mm -hmm. very concerned. Yeah, so very. this was a very quick way for me to show you from yeah, the no, thank you. to the 2019. Um, 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 really, thank you for sharing. And I can encourage you all to um, uh, go to your local bookstore, the drama bookstore, and, and get that book, and not only to support um, artists like Aiko who do actually do create books and write. We all should write more, but also especially artists. Um, and um, and it is extraordinary, also an expensive book. So many color photos, such a large and big one is a beautiful work that really I think is a testimony in its heaviness, heaviness and weight um, um, to it. Um, you also write, or you and William were inspired by Jean-Luc Nancy, who actually was also yes. on Siegel Talks. He gave one of his last oh. interviews, if not the last one. Oh, he wow. said that his book, uh, After Fukushima, The Equivalence of Catastrophes. Why yes. was that important to you? Yeah, just because Fukushima is not about the story of Fukushima. It happened in Fukushima, but it all reminds us what happened in Fukushima can happen anywhere. And it did happen. Um, so what, what, what we are saying, just like atomic bomb, is not about Japanese story. It is American story, but it is also international story because it's not just American people or American army prepared it, right? So there has to be the scientist, there has to be engineering, there has to be the, all the human so-called progress has brought to that. Right? So in the same way, nuclear plant is everywhere. So it is a part of the human being's um, never ending so-called productivity, never ending our need that we need energy, never ending the greed of the corporations, right? So all mm -hmm. those things are, we have it in common. So it's not only happened to Fukushima. What happened to Fukushima can happen anywhere. It doesn't take earthquake to have a nuclear disaster. It doesn't happen, there doesn't always have to be a tsunami that is necessary to make a nuclear disaster. In that way, we are really a part of the ways how humans had created such a scale that disaster can not only hurt us, but all other species and the environment. And we know we notice every <laughs> every single day just opening up the news. Right? So there Maybe are ma now. many Fukushimas. You say there are many Fukushimas. Yes, there are many Fukushimas. There are many Fukushimas within Fukushima, but then there are possible Fukushimas everywhere.
So in that sense, I think Nancy was a, a great guide for us to, to realize that, but it doesn't take Nancy to say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, yeah, to be honest, I lose all my respect. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I uh, remember that line in your concluding uh, thoughts where you say, um, I go to the streets of New York and they were empty in Corona time. They were empty yeah. like in Fukushima. As you say, there are many places. Your book also is brilliant. It's not just one place. You show the entire, uh, you know, there are many rivers. They are no longer rivers. The seaside, the towns, they are. Um, so there are many Fukushimas, but you also draw the line between, you know, Fukushima, COVID. Yeah. Yeah. and uh, other disasters. Yes, very much so. It's all connected. So did you have the same feeling when you walked through the streets of New York and it was empty as you had in the well, as I said, train station know, of... Um, um, of course, the significance... Ke Kido Village, yeah, it's, for example. Yes, yeah? yes, yes. I mean, in a way, yes, because on, on, on all those occasions, we use the words, oh, we were not prepared, or it was, we never imagined or oh, this was beyond our imagination, right? So when I teach in my class, I kind of ask my student not to use the words I can't even imagine. Because if we can't imagine, obviously you're not prepared. So our, our ability to imagine is important because our ability to imagine makes us be able to hesitate to the certain development and also makes us to be prepared in a way that is not at all a, like pure shock or like as if like a sky had fallen down. Sky did not fall down. Sky might fall down if we continue this way. <laughs> so it is, it is crucial for, for humans to realize that everything human make do break. Nobody buys a piece of desk or a toaster or a heater thinking this will last forever. Everybody knows certain things do break. But why we had been fooled nuclear plants are supposed to be safe. They were never safe and nobody can ever say they are completely safe. There are not such a thing as that rust as things were made. And the human body is mortal. And by being in Fukushima, one of the things really struck me is, ah, sea wall breaks. Ah, house does break. Ah, nuclear plants break. Because body, our body break down, our body die, our body gets sick, our body has an accident, injuries. So I think with what we create, imitate our body. Because it is our body that dominate our thinking. And I don't think it's consci conscious, but I think it makes sense to me. And I think it's important for humans to know we are mortal, and what we create are mortal. And when it is being mortal, if somebody dies quietly, it's one thing. But if somebody makes a humongous noise, humongous violence, not only that person dies, but other people get hurt. And I think more complicated, especially things like nuclear plants, which is bound to affect by radiation. It is, it is crucial for me to at least share with people the fear, the tension, the regret that I have felt in Fukushima. And that continues as I gain more knowledge along mm. the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think as sharing has been such a big part of, of your and your and uh, and uh, Koma's uh, work um, in a way for a long time. You wrote, um, dancing in Fukushima is a naked experience. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Well, naked in a way, <laughs> you know, Koma and I had many pieces that we perform naked, okay? Mm -hmm. Many pieces from the 83 
to about 2000, we had many naked pieces. Mm -hmm. At Bhutto oh, no. tradition also, yeah. No, because that's different because Bhutto mm -hmm. people do hide certain uh, sexual organs. Mm -hmm. Now we don't, we are uh -huh. completely naked, okay? Okay. And, but when I say naked is, I'm contrasting it to nude. Nude is a kind of sexualized, you know, words that you are expecting the viewer, but naked is it's a very existential word, right? Mm -hmm. So when I, human beings are hard to be naked, we don't have any covers, you know, we don't have, you know, a hair, not long hair to protect ourselves, so we get cold. So it's a very miserable, you know, helpless thing, right? And being in Fukushima, you do feel you can one well, you cannot you cannot see radiation you cannot smell radiation, but you know it's there. You no, know, I measured it right, and we know that from from the information. And in that, even though I, I was closed, I felt very unprotecting, unprotected, right. So in a way, it's naked. But in a naked, in a way, no adjective can come in. You are lost with your words. So you exist. You know, we cry, but it's not a sentimental cry. It is a, a deeper, it's not a cry of expression. It is a cry of our core. And I felt naked, meaning helpless. That, that's something I cannot rely on. We have come to this point of our human development to feel so helpless. And people are making the things they don't know how to fix. And, and people are making things that could be so harmful to other species, as much as also to the environment. So that was a very much like, you know, so like the words fail, even though I did write quite a bit of uh, um, essays over time in this book. But I think our first sense of experience is we are lost. We lost our words. We lost our senses. We lost our normalcy. We lost our things we can rely on. And that is what I mean by being naked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. As you say, miserable. You also say it, 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 you had that line in one of the poems, or <laughs> I want to stay miserable. And I think Samuel said, well, put vulnerability. I'm vulnerable. And you said, no. So it takes a strong, I think, mom, some very strong person to want to stay miserable and to remind instead of saying, oh, let's just go back to normal and let's forget about it and let's go on. Um, and um, so to stay miserable, is that, uh, um, is that guiding your work for the Fukushima book or do you think it is well, a much deeper philosophical concept? Well, I don't know what's deeper, but I do know this is coming also from my post war upbringing. I was born in 1952, which is the year American occupation ended. So this was, you know, of course, ally, but the only America mm -hmm. had a, a general headquarters and the military uh, people there, right? So it's seven mm -hmm. years occupation is a long time. And Japan's most of the city had been air raided. So it's not my experience. I don't know the war. I wasn't alive, I only know it from what we did, what we see, what we heard. But I think because I grew up in a post-war Japan, the, the damage of the war, which Japan started, and in, in, well, the historical things are more complicated, so I don't think I should simplify. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, completely, it was Japan was the invader. Japan was the perpetrator. And in that war, Japan was destroyed. And that was my immediate before my life. You know, so we hear this, we read about it. You grew up always hearing 
artist or philosophers or writers work that are like one, two, three generations before you. And that's how you grow up breathing in the people who had experienced the quite extreme situation, right? So to me, their regret, I have breathed in. I saw the wounded veterans, with, you know, and they weren't well uh, cared for. I saw the many people with difficulties and the social system haven't learned how to care of them yet. So, you know, I, as, a, as a child, I saw people who are not the way our normalcy could imagine. The people were having a really hard time. Not everyone, of course, there are a well-to-do people too. So to me, when I perform, I don't have a desire to, oh, I want to look good, because that's more like a show business. Mm -hmm. So I come from, not from the wanting to do show business, I wanted to do a performance as an art form. And to me, where my beginning memories are not the Japan with Sony, not a Japan with a beauty, but the sense of fa failed place of its own history, damaged place and occupied. And you know, I mean, uh, American uh, military continued to stay on even after the occupation was over, right? So we was a base for yeah. the American military. Still there, yeah. Very much. So mm -hmm. I think these are important things that I don't really, especially having arrived to America and performing for American audience, I never felt like, oh, oh, how, how good she is. That's not what I'm looking. Oh, what's going on here? It's something different from the norm of America. Something what I can bring in from my own core mm -hmm. of my senses, which is not at all happy melody, joke, food, upbeat, fast thing. I take a long time to do certain things in the performance so that it actually could make people somewhat uncomfortable. I hope not torture, but certain people have a hard time because as if nothing happened for a long time. But, you know, I want to show things don't always happen like that. As, as we know, as Nancy says, you know, the things are already happening and it had been happening when it really started to have the force, it makes us feel very small and mm -hmm. very helpless, even though it is a human-made disaster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, these are very, very significant questions and observations and, and, and stands you take. I, I, you, you also write kind of poetic lines or poetry in it. And um, if I can, you know, read some of the lines, you say, where am I supposed to come from? Where am I supposed to go? What have we done? What have we not done? What can I bring that's not there? How can I make performance necessary? My body will carry a piece of Fukushima. So, uh, this is, is very, as you say, it is existential. It is a serious engagement. Um, um, and you say, as a contemporary artist, you say you have to engage with the contemporary world. How do you make the performance necessary? When do you know it's necessary? That's a great question. I, I, I have been asking myself, right? A very yeah, long time, yeah. right? So... In a sense, if I, I, over a long time, create 
works or thread of the performances, where the sense of entertainment doesn't exist. And the audience sort of know about it. You know, if whether they have seen me before or whether they read something or the description of the event. In many ways, I think my audience know, even though they may be surprised, they know this is not a quick, fast, entertaining show. So what, what is it? And when the people come asking the same question, what is it? And then being together becomes necessary. Much the same way if a great comedian would perform and people come because they need to laugh. I also need to laugh sometimes. So that is necessary. You know, if, if we ate very poorly for one week, we crave for very good food. Doesn't have to be expensive food. So that is necessary. Whereas if we eat really well every single day, eating another great meal is not necessary. So part of what I'm saying is the need of the body, need of our mind. During the pandemic, it was very clear, it became very clear to us, right? We couldn't gather. We crave for gathering. I performed in 2020, yes, September in the graveyard, in Greenwood, in Greenwood graveyard in Brooklyn. And for so many people, it was the first time they come to see performance. It was outdoor, you know, really distanced. And I'm not sure if we can call it necessary, but it was very close to the feeling. I was providing almost an excuse, you know, almost just a reason to gather, right? But yet the real reason was really to gather. The real reason is also to gather in the graveyard to really to see that this had always been happening so that we can kind of start to see this much of the death is also a part of a longer period where we accumulate death because we are all mortal, right? So yeah. somehow if when we connect certain elements of our desire and of recognition and by having that experience of I, as an artist, I try to think in a way, am I working in my mind, working in my body, something I am doing it, not a great idea, but if can I continue to think and practice until I feel it necessary? It's part of that is preparation. Because one day, performing in a graveyard may be an idea. Going to the Fukushima is an idea. But as I said, by the time I went one time, going to the second time became necessary. Going to the third time became necessary. By the time I decided to make a book with a photographer, historian, it was necessary for us to go back in 2019, December, which is right before pandemic, right? So if we didn't go there, we would, the book would have ended in 2017. But we were very clear. We don't want to publish a book three years after the last visit. So going back was necessary. And I'm kind of hoping, this might be asking a lot, but you know, this book is not a book that you just read and hoping it's somewhere in the bookshelf. And people kind of look or maybe not even looking they know, oh, Eiko in Fukushima is there. And so it becomes a part of their home. The Fukushima comes in part of their home. Mm -hmm. And then they click New York Times online or New York Times paper, and the Fukushima will continue to be part of our news. Mm -hmm. Right? As the time yeah. goes. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'm, I want to combine those things as somewhat little more necessary than just an idea. Mm -hmm. 
or just like creating an art. Yeah, I am creating an art, I hope. But somehow I want to have that sense of, I really need to do this. And I think as an uh, art receiver, I crave for that kind of art. That when I feel, oh, this artist need to do this. And this artist need my eye, my mind to receive it. So in both cases, it becomes necessary from the artist. And I feel I'm responding to the artist's need to have the mind and eyes to see it. So when I really feel my work is necessary for me to create and to compose and to share, I hope audience knows I actually need them. They're not just a um, flair. They're the essential. And I think it's true for every performance, but I, I want to emphasize that. I need them to see what I have brought to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's true. You, there are many Fukushimas, and it's also, as you say, within Fukushima, then also it's Fukushima in our home, and and we we relate to what is that, you know, they talked about last week, the kind of planetary thinking, what we need, the big disasters, catastrophes we are um, uh, facing, the tragedies of 21st century, um, you know, they are global. It's a climate problem, you know, corona, uh, racism, uh, sexism, uh, homophobia, um, you know, religious intolerance. And, um, and I think you, uh, uh, in a way, um, yeah, make, make these visible. I, I like the cover image where you are sitting on those um, concrete uh, yes. uh, 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 pillars of the seawall. Um, actually, I think, um, yeah, in Chernobyl, as you say, you know, they put concrete around yes. the, 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 the nuclear reactor so nothing can come out, but you can't do it to a landscape. And if, if you do, there's a lot of concrete and for the next, you know, they to kind of childful hoping that the next tsunami will not go over these uh, concrete walls. But you sit there and you see your costume in the air, but there's also a tiny piece of fabric that comes out of nowhere. I don't know what it is. You know, that you make something, first of all, where, where, what is it? And, um, but it stands for that. That's what's not visible. You know, kind of a memory, different generations of people who lived there. Um, also, you know, because I think it's necessary for me to do this work more global warming becomes so clear to more people, right? The need to, to do how, how better create, you know, create energy, the electricity, not using fossil energy is become very important, okay? So then the nuclear plant has been promoted as a necessary way, right? But it's not a clean way to do it because even though it might emit much less CO2, of course, I agree, but when it breaks, and as I said, it always breaks, it's impossible to not, it's impossible to make a claim this will never break, okay? So therefore, the, 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 the idea of the disaster is so prominent I don't want people to feel, oh, it's not good. We know what happened in Fukushima, but you know, we can't really continue to do this global warming, more and more warmer Earth. So let's change, change or add to the nuclear plants. This is where we really have to stand on our feet, thinking, is it really so? You know, can we really invest more into the renewable energy, right? Rather than the nuclear energy. And I think it is important to connect nuclear energy into the nuclear arms. Why so many people had been pushing nuclear energy? Because it also creates the basis for nuclear arms. So in both ways, I think it is important. And again, you know, I'm not, I'm not really making 
my work because I want to make that statement. I can say that statement. So part of the reason that I'm making the work there is to literally to, to feel the body, how the body feels being there and how mm-hmm. other people feel to see my body being there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not a political message as much as my concern brings me there, Your but concern, what I yeah. want them to see is the, the helpless body being in that environment with, yeah. with uh, radiation. Yeah, and that in that kind of mundane, superficial life or existence we do have where we try to ignore that realities, you know, the dangers we live in, the catastrophe actually we live in. And 100, 200 years from now, people will look at our age and it was barbaric, you know, how could they have done that? And um, and so, as you said before, what can I bring that's not there? You, you do show it, that little piece of fabric in a way, I think that mysteriously appears behind the rock, but it's not you. And there's no other dancer, you know, it's like ghost-like right. um, thing. So um, you also, to talking about this, you talk about theater or something that isn't there. You, you, in one of your poems, you say, she remembers, I guess that's a, the dancer, she remembers a tree that had been there before a theater was built. Her arm moves to invite the return of the forest. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so, it, it, yeah, you know, I mean, I actually wrote it. That whole poem was written uh, like seven, eight years ago when I was invited to recite or to create something for the 24 hour event uh, at Guggenheim in the theme of time. So I wrote like three full page poem and my performance was how to pronounce it so that the silence between the lines becomes performative. So you can say the things, but you can say things, right? So we can kind of create this performativity with the words that is a little hesitant, but that is rather insisting, right? So as we, we make this book, I decided to revisit that my time poem to really see what I what do you what do I mean by a performer, by being a performer? Because in the performance you usually start and the end. <laughs> and so certain things happen, right? And that's performance. But we don't want to do the performance just to end. We want to do the performance in a way how the sense of time is a little more bent so that I kind of cling to instead of drinking the water. So to allow a certain time, so that time becomes a different character than our everyday time, right? So it's not a thirsty, therefore I drink water time, but to really feel what is our relationship to the water, right? How does it do to the body? And how the body actually linger certain ways. And to me, that's important. So, when I go to Fukushima, come back, show the work, that's productivity. I want to do the way, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't, I, I don't know what to do with this, but I want to continue doing this so that I can think about it. So I'm clinging the time a little differently rather than It's, we, are, we are in a place where sometimes we can't quite understand. So I really feel the more we are honest about want to cling something that we are losing, such as humanity, such as knowledge, such as understanding, maybe we might, we might hesitate more. And hesitation becomes our thinking. 
maybe it will become a part of the bigger conversation or bigger mm -hmm. recognition of our humanity. Or regret becomes something that is very not seen negative and weak. But the regret could become a force that we, we could give our body to. So that's one of the things I've been thinking as I write those sentences. But I've yeah. always, I've always, even in kind of commerce time, I've always felt I don't really come here just to be another software in a theater. I might want to really think about not only the audience who are here in front of me, but before theater was built, how can I carry that kind of a time? And in that time, Today, I happen to be here. So my job is not only to be the entertainment of this month, of this day, but even to invite audience to feel like, oh, there was, used to be a breeze. Oh, there used to be a storm here. Oh, there used to be some violence. There used to be some rubber affairs here. That is already a drama before theater had been built. And how can I carry that as a part of the, the work I do? Yeah, yeah. That's very, very beautiful and necessary and urgent and in a way part of that naked experience, you know, of, of being alive. And I think your concern for the tree that is no longer there, that goes back to the realization that perhaps humans and mankind and what we are realizing now, we are not the main actors, the French sun king, in a way, at the center of the planet Earth. No, we are in concert with the plants, with the animals. Everything lives through plants. Uh, and Lene said that we have to respect the plants. We live, we only live because of them. There's a critical zone, like 10 meters, like 30 feet above and 30 feet below where we stand. Mm -hmm. This is what gives life and we are mm -hmm. part of it. And if this is no longer there, we don't have it. And it is endangered. And we, put, and we live in times with potential catastrophic um, um, consequence. I think your work is a real contribution. And as you say, it's not part of the entertainment. Feel you make you feel good, have that Broadway smile or whatever oh. one is looking for before or after a fancy dinner that might also not be necessary. It is quite a stunning uh, what you've done in your career, also with um, with um, your partner, you know, with Coma, but also in this solo project. And uh, as you also wrote, you know, you're actually not dancing alone, even if you do a solo. You're with the landscape, you're with present time, with generations of people before you in that place and with the history of that place. And you try to connect us and say, in a way to us, think about your life. How do you connect with your place, your people around you together and gathering? You know, the words are so close to gather together and, um, and to connect our history and to be respectful and think of the invisible and also you know, of what's around us, the tree that is no longer there, but used to be. So it is a, a stunning work. So really, thank you uh, for sharing. And um, we're coming slowly, you know, to an end. It's three o'clock in the night. Uh, <laughs> right. It's a really, I am so uh, sorry. I didn't fully realize it, but noon is our Siegel talk time. We're coming to an end of our Siegel book talk series, which we created because there's no place at the moment also, you know, for writers who worked in the time of Corona were influenced by the moment, by the atmosphere, the experiences to really think hard or why are we doing this? What is it good for? What is really necessary? All that what I could talked about. So um, we're very thankful to have done that. We have almost 200 talks in those two years. Uh, for us, it's a very uh, emotional wow. uh, goodbye also because hopefully next year we will engage with work in the parks and uh, so hopefully festival a bit more outside. And so it might be the end of the Siegel Center's um, focus on the talks only, at least that's our hope. We got many, many great responses. 100, 200,000 people listened. We don't really know. We also got attacked. We were called, I was called narcissistic at looking myself <laughs> on the screen. Um, it's not academic enough. Or Frank said, are you doing now television? You know, basically colleagues said on the other hand, or is it boring book talks on Zoom? I think it's not. And I want to say a few words, you know, why I also feel it is important. There is the great Russian writer Svetlana Alexievich, who, who does these, what she calls polophonic interviews, to listen to many voices, a monument, as she says, to suffering and courage in our time. And she spoke to people from Afghanistan, Jewish 
Russian uh, population that suffered so much uh, and um, people returning from war, which he uh, uh, interviewed and modifying it a little bit. We could say our Siegel talks were like a theater evidence, theater people talking about themselves in an epic chorus a symphonic narrative, a panorama mm -hmm. of souls of people who are in this theater. And it's think it is showing us a history of theater in 21st century, our common history. I think it is an archive of it. And uh, in, at a time, as we said, where our theater collides with the history of the planet and we are all of a sudden influenced, Marvin Carlson pointed out when he said, you know, it's the first time that globally no theater was happening. Even in Shakespeare's time, you could go outside of London during the Blake and they could perform. People didn't. It was a shutdown mosque that had not been shut down in 1500 years was shut down. So it is something very, very um, serious that happened. And Svetlana wrote, <clears throat> which I like in her in her work of the interview work, where she says she's capturing a part of the reality. She said, I've been searching for a method that would allow the closest possible approximation to real life. It has always been attracted to me like a magnet. It tortured and hypnotized me. And I want to capture it. And I think this is also why we did our Siegel talk. She says, actually, human voices and confessions, witness evidence and documents are what she's interested in. This is, this is how I see the world, a chorus of individual voices and a collage of everyday details. And this is how my eye and ear functions, she says. And I admire her work uh, very much. She also got the Nobel Prize. Another inspiration I would like to mention is Jenny Bass. She's the great British French pop singer or punk singer, I would say not pop, she would be upset, but also, yeah, she's a post-punk leader and she created uh, Start Making Sense, the uh, talks on Apple Music, which we also dedicated the theme, our uh, Siegel uh, Prelude Festival, because it is time to make sense again, to take a stand. As you also said, I could say we have to stand up. We have to show our color now. It's a dangerous time, also with the elections coming up. And... Um, Jenny says, you know, I wanted to create something, a platform for artists to share experiences, a podcast for music lovers, or we could say theater lovers here with an open mind um, for an hour. I'm here to entertain you with good music or good theater. And it's a good conversation. It's not going to be boring, but it's a necessary conversation. And she felt she had a passion for a deep conversation, but she needed a sense of community and she wanted to be part of that community, but also make artists feel welcome. And that's what we did with artists from over 50, 60 countries um, joining us. And she says, music has this amazing ability to change us. I think theater too, a talk like today, your book project, your solo dances, it does change us. And she said, this is why I have fallen in love with music since a very young age. And uh, and enables her to believe that she could do uh, something to change the world in a better place and a performance can be life-changing it's a fundamental transpiration a trans uh, formation of an ex of an experience and uh, we talk about ideas and imagination and i think all the theater artists are incredibly caring and actually doing work of politicians thinking about the bigger picture and stopping writing their plays and directing and i think in many ways taking care um, of it also uh, Priya Parker, who wrote a 2014 book, The Art of Gathering. It's a very important book, very early on, why we have to get together and why it is important, what is the meaning of it, but also to change it, to find new ways to make every human gathering. Uh, and this is also what theater people do to make it more significant. Florian Malzacker, who then created The Art of Assembly. I think this is close to our Siegel Talks. And we have been so inspired by many of our artists, Aiko Tiu, but also Abhishek Majumba in India, Hope Arceda in Rwanda, Guillermo Calderon in Chile, and Astrid Nocesiel, Bruno Latour, and Frédéric Aitui with Thomas Oberender, they did the Down to Earth project. They performed outside in Berlin without electricity um, because they said, how can we engage with climate change? But use all that, you know, without even reflecting it, many, many others. So it's been an incredible um, privilege for us to listen to these uh, polyphonic uh, epic chorus uh, of voices from around the world in a way, a global a view um, and a planetary view. And I think this is what is of importance now. 
And you have that in your work. And this is why we also put you here at the end as a show. How can an artist engage in your book in 100 years, 200, 300, and 400 years will be there. If mankind is there and people will say, this is the artist and that's what she did. And she engaged, it was important and necessary. So really fantastic. Uh, and I would like to say thank you to HowlRound for hosting us all these uh, talks. It's been fantastic. My team, Andy, who puts out, you know, the, uh, the talks and the, memor the, 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 the announcements and is engaged with the speakers and never forgets uh, anything to engage with that. And my, my, our collaborator, Tanvi in India, Gaurav and everybody. So it's been a very big uh, effort, even though we are a very tiny, small team. But um, as I said, I feel also it is it was necessary to do this. It will be most probably never happen again for a year and a half or two. It's, um, and we thought we would go back next spring to our place, to our little Seagull Theater Center. But with the COVID at the moment, I think it will still be closed. There will be no mm. public gatherings. So it's a, it's a tough time we are in, but we will be part, I think, I hope, of the change we want to see. So I could... Thank you for, for letting Frank. me ramble on and, uh, and for being here with us. Frank, so yeah. as you, you thank to your crew and the staff, can I just add one, one yes. thing? I feel like all throughout this one hour, I have not really credited uh, William Johnston, my collaborator, yeah. Yeah. because as you said, theater is a place together. But because it is so, sometimes it's hard to bring the people who can't afford to be there. You know, because we tend to gather with the people mm -hmm. who are informed with that event, which is already sometimes limited, was a kind of range of the people. So I think it's also important for people like myself, not only to be happy and grateful to be performing for the audience, but to bring our body to somewhere else, to bring other part of the world. And I think this William Johnston, a camera, photographer, historian, if without his being with me, I could just be dancing in Fukushima and not be able to bring and connect that. So as like any collaboration makes us be able to continue to think and do the work. So I just wanted to end yeah. my time with, with this audience fully acknowledging William, how yeah. important you, it is for a certain yeah. artist to have a deep collaboration and to bring our ability to reach out or mm -hmm. take our bodies elsewhere that is beyond our own comfort zone. So yeah. thank you very no, much. No, you're right. And he also documents, that's what theater artists do, but we often theater are not as good as in visual arts. Visual artists are very, very, very careful of documenting their work and we have to learn from them. You did document and you could see the relation between both of you and the beauty of his photos, the landscape, you, what he captured with your body and your soul. Sometimes also, you know, in the waves, uh, naked actually, sometimes in the clothes and the silk from your grandmother and your mother. And uh, you like, you said, I like to wear clothes of people I would like to remember, you know, so, yes. um, and um, so this perhaps is what theater does. We put on clothes uh, <laughs> of people we would like to remember on a stage, right? Over centuries yes. or honoring yes. um, people. It's a way to look at it. But again, you know, really, um, thank you um, for everything. And uh, we talked a bit more about you and your dance work than about photography. It's supposed to also be a book about photography. If this book would be in the International Center of Photography, they wouldn't talk so much about you. They would more talk about the photos and the art of photo and his, what inspired him as a documentarian in a way. And so, but this is a theater and performance talk. So of course we focus it a bit on you. So um, again, to everybody uh, on our team and Haran, thank you. Thank you, Aiko. Thanks to all the artists, um, over 300, 200 who participated and to our audience um, that did listen to us. It means so much to us. And when I hear back and uh, it's an encouragement and it's also important for the artists often forwarded and to take time out also to listen because what Aiko had to say today is very significant and it's important. And if we would take those lessons for our own lives, but also in our society, the world would, world would be better. And that's what artists have done over centuries to remind us, you know, of our civic duty and, um, but also our, you know, uh, duty to the environment, to humanity itself. And um, it's a great um, example of it to do uh, something that is meaningful and also will stay. 
um, and over that over time. So thank you all. And I hope to see you back next year. And we will send out some mails about uh, the plans for the Siegel Center. And I think for you is now time to go to bed. Yes, uh, I will. Uh, and I apologize. It's now 3.15 in the night in Japan. So, but it was an important talk, a necessary one, I think. And I think also um, we understood a bit more and learned a bit more and have better questions now. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.